السلام عليكم واهلا بكم في حلقه جديده من حلقات orientation to pharmacy practice course in this session i'm going to continue uh, on the same topic that i started uh, uh, last session uh, with the title of routes of drug administration before i go on from now from here i want to remind you what does it mean by the word routes of drug administration as we mentioned before it means through what way, through what means, through what portal of entry the drug will be introduced into the body. So, what about, if we can ask a question, what are the common routes of drug administration? In general, we have two main types, two main categories. First category is enteral, which means that the drug is going to be introduced to the body through the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract. The second category is parenteral. Parenteral, in general, meaning that the drug will be introduced to the body through routes other than the enteral routes or other than the GI tract. However, in most cases, the word parenteral actually uh, is being used to describe now uh, uh, injections, injectables. So you know that when we use parenteral, we mean through injection, through needles. So let's start first uh, discussing the uh, oral route that the, as the first example of the enteral uh, routes of administration. When it comes to oral routes, drugs can be introduced into through oral routes first through sublingual or buccal uh, routes. Uh, as you can see from the word sublingual, it means that the dosage form, the tablet or the capsule, is going to be placed under the tongue, while for buccal routes, it means that the tablet or the capsule, mainly tablets actually, will be retained in the buccal uh, cavity. But the question is, why we go for sublingual or buccal? What is uh, unique or special about sublingual or, or buccal routes? Of course, there are so many uh, uh, advantages of sublingual and buccal routes. First, we can have rapid drug absorption. You know, the buccal cavity and the sublingual uh, space is highly uh, vascularized. There are so many blood vessels, so our drug in the tablet or the capsule can be absorbed through these blood vessels uh, very uh, rapidly. Uh, another, another advantage is drug stability. We actually escaped from the hostile environment in the stomach and, in, in, and also in the in intestine. We have uh, HCL uh, degrading enzymes with all types, but in the mouth, of course, there's still enzymes, but of course, it cannot be compared to what's inside the stomach or the intestine in the GI uh, tract. So for better drug stability, sometimes we may go for sublingual or buccal administration. Another important advantage is we can avoid, we can evade uh, the first pass uh, metabolism or the first pass effect. What is really interesting about this route is your drug is going to be absorbed directly into the general systemic circulation. Of course, later on, it, it will go and pay a visit for the liver, but initially, initially, it will be, admi it will be administered directly into the general uh, circulation, reaching the site of action, before it will be, of course, being uh, metabolized and eliminated. However, ما فيش حاجة في الدنيا مية في المية أبداً والحلو والحلو لا يمكن يكمل يعني زي المثل المصري ما بيقول يعني. We have uh, disadvantages, although I don't like to call them disadvantages. I like the word uh, limitations. For anything, there is there will always be limitations. It may be inconvenient. Imagine that you are having a tablet under your tongue or a tablet sticking to your gum in your mouth. Maybe you will not you you are not going to feel comfortable with this. This route of administration actually works very well for small dose drugs, drugs that can be administered in small doses, while if the, these drugs to be contained in tablet or capsules are of high doses, for example, uh, paracetamol, you can, you can get like 500 milligrams of paracetamol, some tablets contain 1,000 milligrams of paracetamol, one, one gram. Uh, so for this kind of drugs, uh, sublingual or buccal routes will definitely not be suitable for them. Another uh, disadvantage or limitation that this route of administration it will not be suitable for drugs having bitter taste or un 
pleasant uh, taste نوزي uh, taste that can cause uh, nausea يعني ممكن تخيل واحد نفسه uh, تغم عليه uh, definitely uh, for these drugs we will never go for sublingual or buccal uh, route now we move into uh, the same oral route but this time the dosage form will be swallowed it will will have it as a whole to the stomach directly and we call this route uh, oral route or per os means these tablets or capsules or liquids that are going to be ingested to the stomach of course this is the most convenient route of drug administration uh, simply we, we use it for uh, eating for drinking so it can also work with uh, drugs tablets capsules syrups suspensions for so many uh, dosage forms another advantage advantage with the oral uh, route of administration that you get a longer contact time between the dosage form between the drug and absorbing site or the absorption site as you know drug may stay like for three hours in the stomach and then moves into the intestine and stays for like maybe six to eight ten hours and this longer time it provides a chance a possibility of the drug to be better absorbed you know that for example in the intestine we have uh, almost all kind all types of absorption mechanisms drugs can be absorbed passively through its simple diffusion they can be absorbed actively uh, with carriers transporters so the in general in general the longer the time the better the chance for absorption although the, the this role there's for this role there's so many uh, exceptions relatively cheap and safe cheap relatively when you compare uh, tablets and capsules for other uh, dosage forms uh, injectables for injection for example inhalations they are they are cheaper than uh, the other dosage forms safety actually comes from there is a chance to recall to retrieve the drug at the case of uh, emergency toxicity over dosage through uh, gastric lavage for example while in case of other routes like uh, intravenous injections it's almost impossible to retrieve the drug once you administer it, uh, it into the, the blood circulation what about the limitations of oral uh, route of drug delivery in fact we have a major problem it is difficult to uh, control the bioavailability to control uh, absorption of course the drug will be absorbed but what about the, there's so many factors that we discussed in last session affecting drug absorption uh, following oral administration what about the GI conditions the pH of the stomach uh, emptying rate of the stomach food drinks disease conditions so there's so many factors affecting the bioavailability of orally administered uh, drugs also all drugs that are administered orally they will be absorbed but they will go through the portal circulation first so they were going to pay uh, a visit uh, to the liver where some drugs some drugs are extensively metabolized in the liver what we call a first pass effect like nitroglycerin, like propranolol for example aspirin itself uh, suffers from extensive first pass uh, metabolism and this affects the amount of intact drug that will reach the general circulation later on the patient condition uh, is the patient uh, conscious why sahi and who unconscious uh, vomiting diarrhea so all these conditions definitely it will affect drug absorption following oral administration we move now into rectal uh, route of administration using rectum the, the the last the final part of the uh, GI tract w what makes us go for, for for rectal administration definitely there is a, a rationale behind behind this it makes very good sense through rectal administration we avoid the hostile environment of the stomach the pH degrading enzymes uh, we can get local both local and systemic effects following rectal administration of course most of drugs that are administered rectally 
actually we, we aim for local effect. We administer suppositories uh, through the rectum mainly for local effects. For example, we can use uh, drugs that uh, can treat inflammation for hemorrhoids, uh, vasoconstricting drugs also for hemorrhoids. We can use uh, suppositories uh, for laxative effect we, we, to stimulate the bowel movement to treat uh, constipation. Of course, we can also get systemic effect, drug absorption that drug that will go directly to the uh, to the general circulation, and the same thing like sublingual uh, absorption through rectal uh, administration, we can evade the first pass metabolism. Through rectal uh, absorption, we can also it can be also suitable for uh, patient conditions, for example. Uh, very young patients, infants, children, uh, very old patient, elderly, uh, patients who are suffering from, uh, they are vomiting. So, in this case, uh, rectal administration actually provides a suitable uh, alternative. As usual, we have challenges, we have limitations. The biggest challenge facing rectal uh, administration, rectal absorption, that is erratic and incomplete. Erratic meaning that you can never predict the amount of drug reaching the circulation. There's so many factors that can really affect rectal absorption. Incomplete meaning that you can hardly get 100% bioavailability. 70%, 80% will be acceptable, but, but more than that is, is questionable. Of course, you are administering drug to the rectum, then you are going to risk uh, rectal irritation uh, happening to the uh, to the patient, and of course another another issue, another challenge that's really uh, significant is the cultural sensitivity. At some places of the world, actually, they, they consider uh, the use of uh, suppositories or the use of rectal uh, rectal administration is is rather uh, offending. So, uh, they, they never use uh, suppositories. They don't like suppositories. They hate suppositories. Okay, then we now move to the parental routes of drug administration. One of the most very common and very famous uh, parental administration routes uh, is the injections, injectables. And I told you in the beginning of the session that sometimes we use parental meaning injections. So we have so many types of uh, injections. I'm going to focus mainly on the four very famous uh, types of uh, injections. But in general, for parenteral route of administration, what are the uh, advantages? Of course, rapid onset compared to oral deliveries. Rapid onset, definitely. The, you can bypass the first pass metabolism. All the GI hostile conditions are not there anymore. You go either directly to the to, to, to the blood, or it you will reach the blood, avoiding all this kind of uh, annoying uh, metabolism or enzymes or pH that may degrade your drug. More accurate dosing, especially with intravenous uh, uh, administration, meaning that you you have a better control uh, over the the administered dose. You know exactly what. How, the amount of drug reaching the general circulation. And of course, less GIT irritation for some drugs. For some drugs that are irritant for GI uh, tract, we can go for a uh, parenteral uh, route. Challenges, of course, painful. You are using needles. You are going to inject the drug into the patient using needle, so it's, it's painful. Of course, another, another huge challenge that there is a, a potential for infection. So you are going to administer the drug through a needle. If, if the, you are administering the drug uh, uh, without considering aseptic techniques, without having a sterile uh, uh, needle, without having sterile formulation, then you are really risking uh, uh, infection. That's, it could be very dangerous. And actually, this is why it, it may explain why most uh, injectable products are expensive, because you, you have to sterilize them. Also, no drug recall you have risk of toxicity or overdosage. Once the drug is there, it's very difficult to, to retrieve the drug. So it's very difficult to handle uh, toxicities. In most cases, the injectable uh, formulations should be 
isotonic, meaning that they should have the, the more or less the same osmotic pressure of uh, the, the blood or uh, the biological fluids. Uh, why we go for isotonic to avoid irritation? It's very, sometimes very dangerous if you inject uh, a non-isotonic. Although I have to tell you something, in some cases, or at some cases, especially with the uh, intramuscular injection, maybe, maybe we go for a little bit hypertonic uh, uh, conditions that might uh, enhance direct absorption from the muscles. But this is an exception, it's not a general uh, case. So these are the main four uh, or main common parenteral routes. We have intravenous directly to the vein, we have intramuscular directly to the muscles, we have subcutaneous in the subcutaneous tissues, the fatty tissues. Intradermal, we inject the drug into the dermis, into the skin. So let's take them one by one. We start first with the intravenous route of drug administration. Definitely, the first advantage is that we, we have very rapid onset of, of action, almost within seconds. So we are going to administer the drug to the patient through an injection, intravenously, and you, you, you may start to, no, to notice effects while you're still uh, giving the injection. Of course, we give the injections uh, very, very uh, slowly to patients. So we can start to, to see and to notice uh, the effect, the pharmacological effect starts to, uh, to get to, 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 to appear. Bioavailability, here is 100%. We have 100%. The, all the amount of drug will be delivered to the, to the blood, so you can accurate, accurately calculate uh, what is inside the body of, of the drug. Another very, very important advantage of intravenous route of drug administration is you can inject whatever the volumes, small volumes, ampoules, like two to three milliliters, five milliliters, 10 milliliters, you can even go for large volumes, continuous intravenous administration. We call it uh, infusion. So you have intravenous injections, small volumes, you have intravenous infusions, large volumes over a, a longer period of, uh, of time. And the good thing about that, why, why it's, it's a very, 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 very significant advantage is through uh, uh, injecting uh, large volumes for a certain time, you ensure a constant, a constant uh, drug level in the blood within the therapeutic index, of course. And this constant level is, is required to control or to treat uh, disease conditions, especially that when the, the, the patient is hospital, hospitalized, you, you need to ensure a constant level of drug for a certain time to get the desired uh, drug uh, effect. So you can, you, there is no limit for injected volumes intravenously. Uh, of course, you have to adjust uh, tonicity, it has to be isotonic, definitely. It has to be sterile, absolutely. But, but it gives you a, a sustained, constant drug level in the blood, which is a very significant advantage uh, for the intravenous uh, route of administration. What about the limitations? Of course, safety, safety comes first. It's very likely to have uh, severe uh, reactions uh, for, of the, against the drugs that are being injected. We call it anaphylactic or anaphylaxis uh, condition as a result of overdoses or, or hypersensitivity or allergy to some uh, drugs. So we start to have to see problems happening immediately uh, with the patient. This is why we always, we always advise, even by, by law, you cannot actually give intravenous injections uh, at home or even at the pharmacy. It should be given uh, at, the, at, at, at hospitals, just in case. If anything goes wrong, then we can, we can have a possibility to handle the situation. Otherwise, it's very difficult to retrieve or to handle a, a, a toxicity problem with intravenous injections. Another, another problem that the patient may suffer from uh, inflammation around or of the veins, we call it thrombophilobitis, as a result of leakage of the uh, drug solutions around the veins. It, it, it might cause inflammation and you can, you can notice the change of the color at the site of uh, injections. Another important issue that should be considered that for intravenous injections, for intravenous infusions, the drugs delivered should be 100% uh, soluble, water soluble. So we have water 
uh, as a medium, as a vehicle, and, dr and drugs should be 100% water soluble. We cannot, we can never inject uh, suspensions uh, intravenously. We are risking a lot of problems if we do like that. So mainly we, we inject solutions. Of course, there are exceptions, exceptions, but 99% we inject uh, true solutions. Drugs are being 100% soluble in uh, water. Now we move to intramuscular route of administration. Intramuscular, yeah, it's very clear from the from the name. We are, we are heading, we are aiming muscles. So we are aiming muscles, especially big muscles. But actually, we can inject in any muscle. But we go for big muscles uh, in order to retain a bigger volume of the uh, injection. So for intramuscular, of course, they they are not that fast. They're like intravenous, but definitely faster than. Uh, oral route of administration and of course we, we evade uh, the hostile uh, environment of the GI tract. Another important advantage of intramuscular route of administration that we can inject suspensions. You remember when we're talking about intravenous I said we can never inject suspensions but for intramuscular uh, administration we can use suspensions even we can go for oils so we can have a variety of, of formulations, suspensions, oils, and, 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 and the main idea about using uh, suspensions or oils is to control the uh, duration of uh, drug effect. We can do, control also the drug release from the injection site. So by using suspensions or oils, we can have slower onset of drug uh, action, a little bit not that fast, but we can have also an extended duration of action. It could be weeks and sometimes it could be months. So this is of course a very good uh, advantage. I can give you an example. For some uh, patients suffering from uh, rheumatoid fevers, so part of the treatment they have long-acting uh, penicillins, uh, antibiotics. So instead of injecting every day a single injection for a kid, for a, for a child, every day it's very painful. We can give one injection per month. So you can imagine we, how much uh, suffering we are sparing the uh, patient by using long-acting uh, injectables. For limitations of intramuscular injection, of course the volumes are limited. For intravenous, we can inject whatever volume over an extended period of time. But for uh, intramuscular injection, we have limited volumes. In most cases, it's around five milliliters from three to five. Sometimes we can go for a little bit uh, bigger volumes, but it will never exceed 10 milliliters. Because if we do so, we are risking uh, inflammation and pain at the site of uh, injection in the muscle. What about subcutaneous route of, of administration? Actually, this is a very famous uh, injection route because we all know that diabetic patients, patients who suffer from diabetes mellitus, they get insulin th through uh, subcutaneous uh, injections. And, and, the, and, and the advantage of subcutaneous that is that it could be uh, performed personally. The patient can give himself or herself the injection. Also, the drug release can be controlled again for subcutaneous injections. The formulation could be a solution, it could be suspension, so we can control the rate of drug release and the duration of drug uh, action. As I, as I said, subcutaneous route is very famous uh, with insulin and heparin and of course adrenaline can be used, can be injected subcutaneously as well. When it comes to limitations or challenges uh, of subcutaneous raft administration, it, it can be considered slower compared to intravenous, definitely, and even to intramuscular. And of course, we can inject limited volumes under the skin. I think one to two milliliters uh, would be the appropriate volume. We cannot actually go for bigger or larger uh, volumes than two milliliters. Intradermal. Uh, injections. Now we are injecting the drug into the skin itself, into the dermis, 
part, it's the, the main part of the skin. So I inject them direct, we're going into the dermis. And we use it for mainly vaccines are injected, can be injected intradermally. And of course, one of the most important applications of uh, intradermal uh, injections or route administration is uh, immune uh, test, for example, you want to test uh, for some people so, uh, having uh, a tuberculosis, uh, for example, then we go to inject into the into the their, their skin a very small volumes of, uh, of uh, injection, and then you wait for the response. For positive people, you can start to have to see some skin uh, reaction that indicates these people are are having to carrying tuberculosis. So it can be used for immune test for allergic test. Some people, they don't know to what allergens they have allergy. So that's to, to make sure or, to, or to, to know what are the allergens uh, that can trigger allergic reaction with some patient, we inject different allergens uh, into the skin and we watch for the re skin reaction later on. When it comes to limitations, the main limitation is that we, we have to inject very, very small volumes, less than one, milli one milliliter, like 0.1 or 0.2 uh, milliliters. We can't go for more. We don't have that much space that can accommodate larger volumes of injection. Are there any other types of, of, of uh, inject injection rounds? Definitely yes. Intravenous, intramuscular, subcutaneous, and dermal, these are the, the, the most famous, the most, the, the most common routes. But there are so many other injection routes. We have interpretin, Peritoneal, we inject direct into the peritoneal uh, cavity. Some uh, vaccines can, can be injected uh, this way. Intrathecal, we go directly to the brain and uh, we can escape the blood brain barrier. We go directly, we, we will place a drug into the very close to the, to the, to the CNS. Intraarticular, we inject into the joints. In some cases, patients suffering from severe uh, arthritis who can inject uh, corticosteroids into uh, their joints to, to uh, treat the inflammation and the pain. Intra uh, cerebral, we go to the brain itself. Intracardiac, an injection directly into to the heart. Can you imagine this? We, we, we are injecting direct, directly into the heart. And I remember uh, it was, I think, in the 90s, this movie, uh, Sean Connery, I guess, The Rock. At the end, you can see Nicolas Cage injecting himself directly into the heart with an antidote for a, a, a poison. Intra-arterial, it's not that common. We inject direct into, directly into the arteries, not the vein, into the arteries. So now we are done with uh, injections or injectable routes of drug administration, then we move to mucosal routes of drug administration. And one of the most uh, important mucosal routes of drug administration is the pulmonary route of drug administration. Pulmonary, who are, who are targeting the lungs, the bronchi, for example. Why we go for the lungs? Of course, it will be very suitable if the patient is suffering from a lung disease, then you are targeting the site of action, the lung themselves, the bronchi themselves. You don't, you don't need to go uh, orally and then the drug will be absorbed to the blood and then it goes everywhere. You are risking side effects. Then you have a, a possibility to target directly the, the lungs, like in uh, lung disease like uh, uh, asthma, lambs and milrabu. So for asthmatic patient, we can go directly targeting the lungs through inhalation. We use inhalation dosage forms, aerosols for example. We have also rapid onset of action. You can start uh, observing or noticing, noticing uh, improvement of the patient condition in, 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 in times of minutes. It could be minutes. You can get local, mainly, we, actually we go for, mainly for local uh, effects through the lungs, but also you can get uh, systemic absorption following uh, pulmonary administration. What about the li limitations? One of the very significant limitations facing a successful pulmonary delivery is you have as a patient to be trained you need to be educated because most patients using aerosols they think that they got the dose 
but actually, actually, for most of them, they don't get the accurate dose. You have to synchronize uh, pushing the button at the same time. You have to inhale, and, and, for, and for many patients, especially the young young patient, the kids, it is very difficult to synchronize. So the dose it ends up uh, in the stomach, other, other than into the the lungs. So the patient has to be trained. Patient counseling is very important uh, in this case. Of course, it's costly. In general, uh, most inhalation uh, products, when you compare it, the same drug in the form of a tablet or a capsule, it's more expensive in the form of uh, inhalation, inhalers or nebulizers or whatever is going to, to, uh, to be used for pulmonary delivery is, is, is more costly. Of course, it can cause irritation uh, in, in the mouth, irritation in the throat. So. Patients sometimes ha have to live with the irritation happening following uh, drug administration through uh, pulmonary delivery. Ophthalmic or ocular route of drug administration, again, we are going mainly for local effects. We are targeting disease conditions that happens to the eye, mainly inflammation, irritation, uh, dry eye, uh, allergy. Diff several different kinds or types of uh, of allergies. We can use antihistamines, corticosteroids, medriatics, drugs that can dilate the eye pupil, uh, especially before examining the eye. Myotics, drugs that actually constrict the eye pupil, and they're, they're being used to treat uh, glaucoma, a very famous uh, eye uh, disease. For ophthalmic uh, delivery, we go for different dosage forms. We can use uh, solutions, drops in the form of solutions. We can also go for suspensions. Some uh, eye drops are formulated in the form of suspensions, meaning that we have drug in the form of solid particles. But be careful. As a formulation scientist, if you're going to uh, formulate an eye drops in the form of suspension, you have to be very careful about the particle size of your drug because if your particles are going to be big, bigger, be in certain limit, the drug itself, the solid particles themselves can cause irritation uh, to the eye. We can also go for ointments. We can use eye ointment uh, beside eye drops. Ophthalmic uh, route of drug administration as, as, as I mentioned, although it's very good to, to target uh, eye conditions, but we have, we have many uh, limitations, many challenges. The most important challenge is the very short contact time. Uh, by default, eye has a normal defense reflex mechanisms. You blink all the time. So if you uh, are using eye drops uh, in your eye, how much time the drug is going to be in contact with your eye? Maybe seconds? Minutes? This is to be very hopeful. Also, you have tears that is, are going to wash away all the drugs uh, administered. So, so the, main, the bigger challenge facing ophthalmic uh, raft administration or ophthalmic uh, dosage forms is a very short contact time. Again, as a formulation scientist, what we can do to, to overcome this problem? First, if we're going to use a solution or a suspension, a liquid, drops for example, then we can add uh, excipients that can increase the viscosity of the drops. So by increasing the viscosity, we actually are aiming for a prolonged time of contact with the eye. So maybe, maybe, maybe our formulation will stick a little bit to the eye uh, compared to if we have a normal solution without with, with very low viscosity. Another strategy is we can go for uh, ointments. I know it's very lousy, it, it will be very messy, but you are actually having better or, or enhanced contact time when you go for eye ointments. We have enzymes in the tears, so drugs may be sensitive to enzymatic degradation. Uh, irritation you have eye and your eye may be inflamed and then your solution, your suspension should be isotonic uh, otherwise it will cause uh, irritation for your eye. Of course 
uh, like injectables, eye preparations uh, must be sterile. We cannot actually uh, risk introducing uh, organisms uh, or infection to uh, your eye. What about the nasal route of drug administration? I think most of us actually tried before uh, nasal drops, uh, nasal uh, sprays, so it can be used as drops or, or sprays. What are the advantages? Again, you, have, you don't have this kind of hostile pH like in the GI tract. You can get both local and systemic effects. Although we actually go for mainly for local effects following nasal administration, we can, most drugs will be uh, decongestants to treat congestion, nasal uh, congestion. Uh, but also we can go for systemic effects. Some drugs can be absorbed from the nasal uh, mucosa, uh, through the nasal mucosa. Uh, calcitonin is a hormone can be used for treatment of uh, osteoporosis. It can be absorbed uh, following nasal administration. Uh, in fact, th there is a lot of research on uh, the use of nasal delivery for insulin. Would you believe it? Yes, insulin. Instead of having uh, injections all the time, maybe at some point in the future we can administer insulin uh, through the nasal uh, cavity. Again, you can get a direct CNS effect. Some drugs, they get absorbed and they go directly to the CNS. Of course, Ashar Misal at long. Heroin, heroin, cocaine, they can be, they can be absorbed directly into the uh, CNS. Challenges? The same like for ophthalmic crowd administration. The contact time is very limited. Very limited. Uh, you, your formulation is going to sooner or later be washed away from the nasal cavity. So we can also actually use the same strategies. Maybe we can increase the viscosity, trying to uh, prolong the contact time of the drug with the nasal uh, mucosa. We have enzymes, so some drugs are sensitive to enzymatic degradation uh, uh, inside the nasal cavity. For nasal administration, it fits very well with small dose drugs, but for large do dose drugs, it, it will be unlikely, so it will not be practical to administer them through the nasal uh, route of administration. Of course, of course, we can have nasal irritation, irritation of the nasal uh, mucosa as well. Vaginal route of administration, again, with vaginal route of administration, we can get local and system effect. Again, we, in most cases, we target uh, uh, local effects. Many drugs can be used. We can use uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, we can use uh, antiseptics, sometimes anti-fungal drugs, uh, uh, treating fungal uh, infections. Uh, hormones, hormones can, be, can work either locally or can they, they can be absorbed uh, from, uh, through the vaginal mucosa. Some drugs, the prostaglandins, actually they can be absorbed and we can get systemic effect following vaginal uh, administration. What, what, are, what is the shape of the dosage form? I'm going to discuss it in, in next sessions, inshallah. You can use uh, vaginal suppositories, we call it pessaries, uh, vaginal tablets, uh, solutions, so creams, so that's there are many dosage forms that can be used uh, for vaginal uh, administration. And of course, we avoid first pass metabolism. Limitations. Local irritation is a main challenge. Also, some drugs may be degraded at the lower pH values of the vaginal fluids. When I say low, of course, it is low, but it cannot be compared to the low pH of the HCL in the stomach. So we have low pH uh, values uh, 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 in the vaginal fluids as a result of presence of lactic acid. And of course, like rectal delivery, there, there are so many problems in some places regarding uh, cultural issues. I mean cultural sensitivity. For some, maybe they're not accepted uh, at some places, some cultures to be uh, used. Now we are moving uh, toward the last uh, type of parenteral uh, rather drug administration, which is uh, administration of the drug through the skin. In general, when we go for the skin, in most cases we are aiming for 
uh, topical or local drug delivery. So the, the drug is going to act or exert the effect at the site of administration of the skin or nearby. Also, we can, these drugs can be used for uh, cosmetic uh, uses. Uh, for example, emollient uh, creams, uh, moisturizers, uh, anti-aging uh, formulations. But of course, there are other uh, uh, uses uh, for uh, topical drug delivery. We can use uh, insect, uh, insect for insect uh, repellents, uh, keratolytics. Keratolytics meaning that drugs that can peel the skin. In some cases, when we want to peel the skin. Uh, so we use cratolytics, like for example salicylic acids. Antipruritics, uh, these are drugs that treat uh, itching, so uh, we can use them uh, topically, of course. So these drugs are mainly going to produce the effect uh, locally. However, through the skin we can get systemic effect, but we call it transdermal delivery or percutaneous delivery. When you say transdermal, transdermal, your drug is going to penetrate through the skin, through the stratum corneum, and it will reach uh, blood through the skin. So here we apply the drug on the skin, but we are aiming for systemic effect, uh, a generalized effect. What are the advantages of uh, transdermal drug delivery? Of course, you avoid the first pass metabolism. You go directly into uh, the, the the blood through transdermal drug delivery. For example, when, when you when you stick a patch to your skin, you get a constant a constant drug release into uh, the blood. Sometimes, sometimes it is very quite comparable to what you get uh, after uh, intravenous infusion, not injection, infusion, you get some sort of a constant drug level in the blood, which is very good. So you can stick the patch for like one day, couple of days, or even a week, and at, at, at this period, at, the, at, at this time, you are having the drug level constant uh, in the body. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, significant advantage. Of course, it's easy to terminate the drug effect. At any sign of toxicity or overdose, simply you can just simply take away the patch and you stop uh, drug absorption. Another thing, I'm not going to go in detail, but it's very interesting uh, about transdermal uh, research, drug delivery research, that it can be enhanced. You can enhance drug absorption through the skin by so many ways. For example, you can use electricity. Of course, electricity uh, at low voltages, you're, going to, you're not going to hurt the patient. You can enhance drug absorption through the skin by using sound waves, ultrasounds. You can use heat. By applying heat, you can enhance drug uh, delivery through the skin. You can use micro needles. Micro needles, not like a needles, a standard needles for injection. No, it is a very small patch that contains micro needles that will deliver the drug into uh, the skin. Of course, you can use controlled formulations uh, like uh, vesicles, niosomes, transferosomes, liposomes, any zomes that can help uh, delivering drug through the skin uh, to the uh, to the general to the blood to the general circulation. But, as usual, there are so many uh, challenges and limitations. Not any drug can be formulated in the form of a transdermal drug delivery system, like a patch, for example. It, it works very well for low-dose drugs, for small molecular weight drugs. It, it doesn't work for large molecular weight uh, drugs. I, I give you the most famous example uh, for drugs that can be successfully delivered through the skin. Uh, nicotine, you know there are nicotine patches available uh, at the pharmacy. Nicotine is a very small drug, very, it's a little bit is okay, and uh, it's low molecular weight uh, drug. There's so many variables of the patient that can affect uh, transdermal absorption. Uh, the age of the patient, at low ages, like for infants, I think we will 
it's very unlikely to go with a patch because the skin is not well established stratum corneum the outermost layer is not well established so you might have an overdose or toxicity following uh, uh, at Mr. Uh, applying a, a patch to, to an infant on the other hand for elderly uh, skin is almost dry and the lack of water in the skin in fact uh, does not help uh, transdermal uh, absorption so dry skin is not good presence of hair for example shaving when you remove the hair with razors you are actually getting rid of uh, stratum corneum so it's very dangerous to, to, to shave and then you stick the patch sometimes you, you might get an overdose the side application where you are going to stick uh, the patch behind the ears you have the thinnest skin or for example in the hand palms or soles of the feet very thick uh, very thick skin of course for some people for many people they, 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 they feel irritated when they when they uh, use uh, our stick a patch on the skin they feel uh, they, they, they suffer from ir skin irritation so it doesn't work for all patients and it doesn't work for all uh, drugs there are very limited drugs like nicotine uh, some hormones testosterone uh, estrogens uh, it also works with uh, scopolamine that's a, it's a relative to atropine uh, that's used for treating motion uh, sickness so it works for very very limited uh, number of drugs and, it's, and it's of course it's expensive uh, the last the last example is the oral or the ear drug delivery otic drug, drug delivery and of course as you know we mainly target uh, local uh, effects following uh, otic uh, application or otic administration uh, mainly antiseptic drugs uh, local antibiotics sometimes we use uh, solvents to dissolve uh, excessive uh, or extra wax for some people who are suffering from uh, extra or excessive uh, ear waxing there are a lot of ear wax uh, produced so we can use wax uh, softeners we can in the form of uh, mainly uh, drops I think we reach it uh, the end of our session so I have to thank you very much for listening and for being there thank you very much